Welcome. It's so great to have you all in the same room, my ethics boot camp students, and some guests in the community. Thank you for being here. We're so grateful that you've come to join in with this. For those of you who are not students at Daniels, this ethics boot camp is a pioneering event for the school, one created and thought up by the, our yours truly, uh, Corey Cicchetti. And this is a, a truly inspiring event for these students to go through, and I'm hoping the students are enjoying it already, right? Yeah, thank you. Uh, we've already participated in some activities, and then they're going to see some amazing speakers, starting with Professor Cicchetti, to really inspire some integrity. And I get the amazing pleasure to introduce to you my mentor, my colleague, and probably one of my best friends. Professor Cicchetti speaks around the nation with his Inspire Integrity talk to schools and professionals around the country, including third graders in the Adams County District, which you guys are going to be better than third graders, right? Of course, yeah. And his, his speech moves you, and I'm hoping that you guys will enjoy it, because every time I hear it and every time I get to interact with my friend, he really truly inspires me to be a better person. I'm so grateful to be able to interact and be a part of this with you, and so I won't take up too much of his time. So if you'll please help me welcome your keynote speaker, Professor Corey Cicchetti. Thank you. That was awesome. Good evening, everybody. Cool shirts. Do you like them? So I was reading the newspaper, this was about four years ago, and I'm reading through the newspaper, and there are all these terrible stories. The first story was about war, and then there was one about deficits and debt and economy and shambles, and I'm thinking, I don't want to read this anymore, so I'll read the business section. Y'all can relate. You'll read the business section. I opened up the business section, and I thought, well, this will be better. And it was worse. Bernie Madoff, right? Lawyers getting arrested for insider trading. It might have been well have been called the white collar crime section. So I said, I'll open up the sports page and that'll be better, right? And it was Roger Clemens allegedly lying to Congress. Barry Bonds on steroids. There was an NBA basketball official who was in cahoots with the mob shaving points off basketball games. It wasn't even sports. I couldn't find a sports score in there. And I'm thinking, I have one section left. The arts, right? It's where the crossword puzzle is. I'm gonna open it up and it's gonna be better. Please let it be better. And I opened it up. It was better in, in the wrong way. The front page article said, one out of every three Americans has been found to be ugly. <laughs> so I read that, I'm like, well, that can't be true. Well, maybe it is. Let's see. So I read it, and they found a way to determine who's ugly and who's not. So I want to do a little experiment in here tonight. I want you as quietly as possible to look at the person on your left. Is that person good looking? Then I'd like you as quietly as possible to look at the person on your right. Is that person good looking? If the person on your left is good looking and the person on your right is good looking, the ugly one is you. <laughs> That's what I learned from the New York Times two years ago. I, I want to set the stage a little bit for this uh, just by telling you my story. And I went to school here. I met my wife here. I'm a proud alum of this place. I love this campus. I went to school here before we had all these pretty buildings. But when I walked in this, these doors, I, I'm just reminded of this song. And I wasn't thinking of it at the time, obviously, but you know what song this is. And I was trying to figure out who I was. What defines me? What do I stand for? And I, I was coming in here, and I'm thinking, what should I major in? Well, I liked history. I liked political science. I liked all those things, and I thought I would be good at it. But there was a little voice in the back of my head, and it said, Corey, you just need to be rich. Anyone have that voice? Let's see if I can talk you out of that a little bit, right? And if I could be rich and have a fancy car and a big house, my life would work out, right? Everything else would just work out. I had watched too much MTV, right? So I'm thinking, I can't be a political science major and, and be rich. I need to be a business major. Now, no offense, because most of you in this room are business majors. I teach business. I love business. When I was a college student, I didn't love it as much, but that's why I chose it. Then I saw that my friends were going to law school, and I thought, if I could just go to law school, <laughs> I think I could be rich. Let me tell you how I chose my law school. I'm a huge basketball fan. My wife and I went on a road trip to look at different schools. We got to Cameron Indoor Arena at Duke University, and I chose my law school. <laughs> And not the best way to choose a law school, right? But I was a huge basketball fan. I just wanted to be a lawyer, not to be a lawyer. I wanted to be a lawyer to be rich. So I walk out of the doors. It's a good law school. I walk out of those doors, and I'm $120,000 in debt. And some of you are thinking, I'm accumulating about that much. I hear you, right? And I'm thinking, now I really need to make a lot of money. Because I still want to buy that BMW, right? 
So I'm interviewing at different jobs, different law firms, and the economy was bad. This was 2001, 2002, the dot-com crash, pets.com, remember that? And, and it was bad, and so I'm interviewing it. I had a couple places choose to interview me. I get to the first place and I ask a question you're never supposed to ask in a job interview. So you have to promise me that you won't ask this, okay? I don't care if you're applying to be a lifeguard. I said, how much do you pay? <laughs> right? Don't ask that. They'll tell you. If you're lucky enough to get the job, they'll tell you. I asked. And this lady looks back at me and she's befuddled. She says, $80,000 a year we pay here. And I'm, to, my, to myself, I'm saying, well, that isn't enough. Went to the next place. How much do you pay? She said, $100,000. And I said, to myself, that isn't enough. Went to the third place and they said, we pay $120,000 a year at this place. And as soon as he said that to me, I was taking that job. But something really interesting happened during the rest of my interview. I left his office and I was walking to the other partner's office. Just, you meet partners, that's how you interview at a law firm. And a guy, I took a bathroom break, and a guy follows me into the bathroom, which is awkward in and of itself, right? And before I could do anything in there, he comes up and he puts his arm around me and he starts to whisper. And you know when someone whispers to you, you just whisper back? There was no reason for us to be whispering, but he goes, your name's Corey, right? <laughs> and I said, yeah. He said, you went to Duke Law School, right? And I said, yeah. He goes, my name's Scott. I went to Duke Law School too. Listen to me, I'm gonna tell you something. Don't come here. This place sucks. <laughs> he took his arm around, off of me and he walked out the door. And I never saw him the rest of the day. If someone said that to you at a job interview, that's a red flag. I mean, tell me that would raise a red flag, right? But I was already thinking about my car and $10,000 a month and I just ignored him. So I took the job. And it was a really good, really prestigious place. We worked on really big deals. One of the deal I was, deals I was on was a $200 million, it was a bond offering. These people were offering bonds. And, and I was just a, you know, a six month attorney. I, didn't, I was useless. But the CEO was there. The CFO was there. The people from Goldman Sachs were there. The auditors were there. Everybody's there working, but they can't have me do anything. I'm new. So I'm just sitting in my office twiddling my thumbs, trying to sleep. And it was like that for a week. I went home for an hour a night for a week. And trust me, that'll take years off your life. So about Friday night of that week, still nothing much for me to do, I'm walking around the halls. And I'm just staring into people's offices, just peeking in there to see what's going going on. These were the senior partners. These were my idols, my role models. Ask yourself right now, who are your role models? Who do you want to be like? Well, I wanted to be just like these people. So I was peering into their offices. Their lights were on and they didn't see me there, but I'm just looking in there and they're working. Went to the next person's office. She's working. Next person's office. He's working. And another voice came into my head and it said, Corey, these people have families. These people have kids at home. They have spouses. I know because when I go into their office during the day, I see the pictures. But we do two, three deals like that a month, right? They were always at work and never home. And I said to myself, this job sucks. I need to quit. That's a problem when you're fresh out of law school with all that debt. So I called my wife. She's here. I'm going to pick on her. Isn't she cute? Wave, Jilly. Isn't she cute? We'll talk about her in a second. And she was my fiance at the time. And I said, honey, I hate this job. I need to quit. And she says back to me in the phone, I didn't marry a quitter. I was like, damn, <laughs> right? I mean, that's the wrong answer. I was looking for some empathy. Women, do you hear me? Sympathy, empathy, I didn't get that. And then she says to me, Corey, what else do you know how to do? <laughs> and I thought, nothing, actually. I know how to teach tennis. That was my job in high school and college. I know how to teach tennis and sort of not really be a lawyer. And she said, knowing that, you can't quit. And I said, please let me quit. She said, I feel like this is one of those situations that we need to compromise on. And any of you in this room in a relationship, you know that you have to compromise or the relationship is broken. And I said, okay, let's compromise. She said, okay. She said, when do you want to quit? And I said, tomorrow. She goes, well, I would like you to give it six more months. Then you will have been there for at least a year. And we talked and talked and talked. And at the end, we compromised. And I gave it six more months. <laughs> And I'm looking at all these guys in this room. You guys are like, dude, what are you talking about? You'll find out. Believe me. <laughs> Believe me. You'll find out soon enough. So I waited a year from when I started. I went to the, a, a partner's office. He was one of the senior partners. His name was Mark. And I knocked on his door and I said, Mark, can I talk to you? And he said, yeah, he liked me. He said, come in, man. What's up, Corey? What's up? And I said, I hate to tell you this. 
I don't know how to tell you this. I don't like this job and I need to quit. And he looks at me and he goes, stop screwing around, man. Here's a file. He was ready to give me another file. And I said, Mark, I'm serious. He looks at me and he says, Corey, nobody quits. I looked back at him and I said, Mark, everybody here is completely miserable. And he looks me right in the eyes and he goes, that's right. <laughs> Which makes for an awkward pause, doesn't it? I was kind of like, see? I didn't say that. I looked at him and I said, Mark, everybody here has had multiple marriages. Most of these people are on their fifth marriage. I'm not making this up. He looks me in the eyes, right in the eyes, and he goes, you're right about that too. <laughs> Awkward pause number two. I'm giving this guy wonderful reasons to quit. And he looks at me and he says, you're not listening to me. Everybody here wants to quit, but nobody quits. And I said, that sounds terrible. Why? And he said, there are two reasons why. Number one is they're broke. And I said, broke, they make six figures a year. Some of them make seven. And he said, Corey, this is the most commonsensical thing anyone's ever said to me. He said, it doesn't matter how much money you make, you can always spend more than you have. Duh, you all took economics, you know. I was naive. I thought if you made $100,000 a year, up to $3 million a year, you'd be okay. And he said, here's what happened. They should have flown coach. They flew first class. They should have bought a million dollar house. They could afford that, but they bought a four million dollar house. They should have bought a BMW 3, 3 Series. They bought a BMW 650. So man, they're stuck. And he said the second reason is worse than the first. He said it's pride. Pride. He said they're too proud. They're too proud to go home and tell their family that they quit this job at this really prestigious law firm. You see, the Chief Justice of the United States Supreme Court was a partner at that time in the DC branch of my law firm. You don't just quit that. How do you explain that to your friends and your family? And he said, so they want to quit, but they can't because pride won't let them. And I said, Mark, let me tell you something. I'm a pretty prideful person, but this job is terrible, but I have a lot of money because here, here's why. I leave the office every night at 11 and everything's closed. I come in the next morning at eight and everything's closed. I couldn't spend the money if I wanted to. And he said, what are you gonna do with your life? And I said, I don't know. And I walked out of his door and off a cliff. Have you ever been there in your life where something was so miserable that you just walked off a cliff? So a couple years later, University of Denver calls me. I had some friends here and they said, Corey, we know you have an interest in teaching. Um, we have a situation, someone died in the ethics and law department. And I'm like, oh my gosh, that's terrible. A student died? And they said, no, not a student, a faculty member. He had been teaching here for a long time and he, and he died. And he said, now we have a job opening. And I'm like, that's weird. I don't know that I want to apply. It's kind of weird. And they said, put it to you like this. Bad for him, good for you. And I'm like, what kind of ethics department is this? I mean, they were kind of kidding, right? And they said, what do you know about ethics? And I said, I don't know much. I went to law school, right? I don't know much about ethics. I tell you that story for two reasons, my background. Number one, if you love what you do, You'll never work a day in your life. You've heard that. There's a caveat to that I bet you haven't heard because I made it up. If you hate what you do for a living, every day sucks. Straight sucks, doesn't it? Raise your hand if you know another adult who hates his or her job. And the rest of you are either lying or need more friends, right? <laughs> this is a bad economy. There's a lot of people who hate their jobs out there. I desperately don't want that to be you. You're in a job that you hate, but you can't quit because you don't have enough money to quit and it takes $100,000 a year to pay your bills? Give me a break. I love what I do now. This ethics boot camp was a pain in the butt to put on. You understand that, right? It snowed this morning, but not once did I say to myself, I don't want to do this. I don't want to go speak to these kids tonight. I don't want to be here. Not once did I say that. I got to fly to Tucson this weekend. Next week, I'm in California. Not once have I said to myself, I don't want to go out there and speak. I don't want to teach my classes on Tuesdays and Thursdays. I love my students. It doesn't mean I don't get tired. But when I was at my law firm, I would look at my watch and I would pray that it would be noon. It would be 9.15. You ever done that? Some of you do that in class, right? It just goes slow. When you have a job that you love, it goes fast. I actually want my life now to slow down because it goes so fast. The second reason I tell you that story is I landed in an ethics department, and as I admitted to you, I didn't know much about ethics, probably nothing. In law school, in studying for the bar exam, we had a law ethics class. It was ethics. There was an ethics part of the bar, and, and we sit in this room, and they would say, sit down and take notes. And I'm a nerd, right? You tell me to take notes? I mean, fine. They said, it's a bunch of rules, and if you memorize all these rules, you'll be an ethical attorney. And I said, okay, go. Rule number one, don't have sex with your clients. <laughs> I'm not making this up. And I thought about that for a long time and I didn't write it down. I'm just kind of like, check. Rule number two, 
don't steal money from your client's bank account. And I'm just like, check. But I was watching my classmates write that down. Don't steal money from a client. And I'm like, we're screwed. This is Duke Law School, right? And you have to write that down? So when it comes up on the test, what was number two? Oh yeah, don't steal money. Are you kidding me? Rule number three, if your client is guilty, you can still represent him. You just can't call him to the witness stand because you know that he's guilty. And I'm thinking, can you email me this list? Just email this to me. And I went through 17 weeks of that. And I didn't know every single rule. I didn't. But the ones I didn't know, I wouldn't do anyway. And I'm thinking, ethics isn't just a bunch of rules on a piece of paper. But a lot of corporations in this country think it is, and a lot of student groups that you're in think it is. The idea is that if we could have these core values, if we could have this mission statement, if we could write this stuff down, we'll have ethical employees. But let me tell you something, Enron had core values. You know this, right? Go home and Google Enron's core values. One of them was integrity. I guess I don't care what you put on a piece of paper. I care what makes you up, your values, your character. What kind of person are you? What do you stand for? One of my fav favorite quotes is, is this. In life, you either stand for something or you fall for everything. And I want to make the case tonight that as a society, especially in America, we have fallen for a lot. We've fallen for a lot of stuff that we think will make us happy and in the end never will. I mean, my question to you tonight is who are you? Because when I was in college, I was a mess. I'm 36 and I'm finally starting to figure it out. But here's the problem, and I know what you're thinking because all my audiences think this. They say, don't worry about me, I'm a good person, right? Well, everybody thinks that. When I go over the country, I used to ask this question. I used to say, let's say I had a room of 1,000 people, okay, so double the size. I would say, raise your hand, 1,000 people, if you believe yourself to be a person of high moral character. That's what I would say. How many hands would go up, do you all think? Thousand. Everywhere I went, Fairbanks, Alaska, hands went up. Manhattan, New York City, thousand hands went up. Who's not going to raise their hand to that? Not me. Uh, yeah, of course you're going to raise your hand. And I would say, okay, awesome. Keep your hand up if you can define for me what it means to be a person of high moral character. And how many hands went down? All. Every single one. All across the country. And I guess I'd ask the same question of you. If I were to say, and I won't do this, raise your hand if you believe to be yourself to be a person of integrity, would you raise your hand? But the more important question is, would you raise your hand and be able to give me an answer when I asked you to define it because you have to, or don't raise your hand? It's like this movie, Hitch. Have you seen this movie? You need to see this movie. Will Smith is a dating doctor, right? Kevin James is going on a date. Will Smith says, what's going to happen tonight on your date? And Kevin James says, well, they'll be dancing. And Will Smith says, let me see you dance. I mean, let's just make sure you can dance. And Kevin James says, dancing, it's the one thing I'm not worried about, right? Will Smith has the best line in the whole movie. You might have missed it. He says, I just need to be thorough, <laughs> which is what we're doing with you at this ethics boot camp. You, you might be the most awesome ethical person in the world. We're just being thorough, because this is what happens. Do not say no. Dance is the one thing I'm not worried about. But if there are people there, and I'm I get worried, uh, stand, and I... I hate to be a stickler, but in, uh, I need to be thorough. And, um, Shut Trust me. Peace up. Yeah. 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 That's what it's all about right there. Yeah. Yeah. See how it gets bigger? Yeah. Now I'm going to start the fire. Put the feet are going. I start the fire. I make the pizza. Hips are always going. Can't get enough hips. From there, the Q-tip. Throw it away. That's not working. You hit it with this. <laughs> Don't ever do that again. I have a question for you. Is that you? If someone asked you if you could dance, would you say, yeah, I look like that? He turns out to be the good guy in the movie, right? So I don't much care about that. Let me ask you a harder question. If someone asked you to raise your hand and admit to being a person of integrity, would you raise your hand and live your life in such a way that you look like a fool and a hypocrite? Thursday night, Friday night, Saturday night, you're all alone in a room, you're taking a test. You're all alone at your company and you have a financial statement in front of you that you could fudge. Man, are you one of those people that would, would raise your hand and yet live your life in such a way that you look like a fool? 
So I'm going to tell you a story. And everything in my life that I do that revolves around ethics revolves around this story. And it was told to me by John Bogle. And I want you to go home and I want you to look this guy up. He founded Vanguard Mutual Funds. He basically founded the mutual fund industry. And we have this program here called Voices of Experience, and it's really neat. And you should come hear these business executives. And he was here, and he was over in Marcus Commons where you just were, and the room was packed with people. They just wanted to hear this guy's wisdom and knowledge. And tell me about the economy and jobs. Man, give me a stock tip. And he gets up on stage and he starts to tell stories. And the whole room was deflated because they didn't want to hear stories. But I'm so glad he told these stories. The first one he told is about this dog. He called him Cash. So think of a dog at the dog track, a racing greyhound. This was the best in the world. The dog had won millions of dollars, had broken records. The press was there. They wanted to get a glimpse just to see this dog race. If you're a horse racing fan, it was like the Triple Crown. Someone was about to win the Triple Crown. This dog was the best. And the dog is sitting out with the owner one night, and they're talking. It's a fable, obviously, right? And the dog says, I don't want to run anymore. And the owner looks back at the dog and says, Cash, wait a second, what? You're the best, and you're in the prime of your career. You're going to give up all this money and all this fame and all this popularity? Are you hurt? The dog looks back at her and says, no. And she says, do I mistreat you? Are you mad at me? And the dog says, you treat me wonderfully. So, no. She says, are you too old? No, I'm not too old. You treat me great. I'm not hurt. She says, why are you quitting? You owe me that. And the dog says, I just realized, after running and running and running all my life, that those little white rabbits I keep chasing aren't real. And a room full of people just sat there and went like this. Like some of you are doing that now. What? Has this ever happened to you where someone says something profound and it takes you 45 minutes to grasp? And so if that's you right now, give yourself 45 minutes. I'll be done and you'll be good. That was me. 45 minutes into his talk, I stopped listening and I started asking myself some really hard, ugly questions. Corey, what do you chase? Well, I told you, I wanted to be rich. I wanted to be popular, and I wanted to be attractive. Sound familiar? <laughs> Americans, right? We're grossly good at that in this country, aren't we? I have 130,000 miles on Delta every year. I get on airplanes. I like to look down the aisles just to see what people are reading, just praying it's a newspaper, and it's never a newspaper. What are people reading on airplanes? What do you know? People Magazine, Us Weekly. Gossip garbage, right? How to lose 30 pounds in three days when people all over the country have anorexia and bulimia and we're reading about that, right? Why was Jennifer Aniston so skinny? Let's, let's rejoice in Tiger Woods' misery or Charlie Sheen or Lindsay Lohan's latest escapade. Let's rejoice in that and we read that. And then we go home and we watch trash on TV, don't we? Like Grey's Anatomy. <laughs> Oops, I said it. <laughs> that show is trash. My wife said, I stopped watching that show when all the married people had slept with all the other married people. <laughs> Why'd you watch it in the first place? That sounds terrible. Desperate housewives. The real housewives of whatever stupid city. Have you noticed it's never the real housewives of Denver, Colorado? <laughs> never. The real housewives of Omaha, Nebraska. <laughs> no, there are values in these places, right? Jersey Shore. Those are my people. Where are my Italians in here? Jersey Shore, giving Italian-Americans a terrible name, right? But we rejoice when those people bust out of rehab and start drinking again. Now let me say this to you. I don't think watching Grey's Anatomy or picking up a People magazine makes you a bad person. It doesn't. It makes you no worse of a person than I am on Sunday mornings when I get up and I watch eight straight hours of football. <laughs> That's what I do every Sunday if I can. It doesn't make us bad people, but let me give you some statistics. All across this country, on college campuses every week, people are getting date raped and sexually assaulted. Did you know that? There is heroin and cocaine in our residence halls. All across this country, I know because they bring me to talk about it. Did you know that 74% of you will cheat in school between freshman and senior year? A self-reported study, so it's probably higher. And we, as a society, care about why Jennifer Aniston is so skinny or what's the latest fashion trend? People are dying and getting raped on campus? Let me say something to you. We're not bad people for watching football or watching that stuff on TV, but couldn't we do more? We don't care about that because we want to be rich. We want to be attractive, and we want to be popular. My students, for the last 10 years, I've had them write essays, and I ask them in the essays, what do you want? And they're really candid with me, and they say, I want to be rich, popular, and attractive. Well, so did I in college. 
So John Bogle walks off stage. And the last thing I ever heard him say, and I'll never forget it, is this. You can never get enough of what you don't need to make you happy. And that's profound too, isn't it? I guess if all you want in life is money, all you'll do is chase. But there'll always be someone richer than you. We have a term for that. We keep up with the Joneses, right? If all you want in life is to be pretty, if all you want in life is to be handsome or strong, there'll always be someone prettier. There'll always be someone stronger. There'll always be someone more handsome than you, and you'll just chase. If all you want in life is to be popular, there'll always be someone with more Facebook friends than you, <laughs> however you want to define that. Now, let me say this to you. There's nothing wrong with money. I'm a business school professor. I still have my BMW that I had at my law firm. Nothing wrong with having nice things. Money is only bad when it defines you. Let me be very clear. I'm not one of those people that says, sell all your possessions and be good. I'm one of those people that says, man, make a million dollars. I don't care, but damn it, be good. You could argue that Bill Gates and Warren Buffett and a lot of rich people have done a lot of good things with a lot of money. There's nothing wrong with money. But if your clothes, your purse, your car, your apartment, your stuff, if that defines you, my friend, you've already lost. There's nothing wrong with being pretty. There's nothing wrong with being handsome. But here's the thing. If it takes you three hours to get ready in the morning, if you change outfits four times, if you drive in and check your makeup the whole way, if you can't go to sleep until you've been on a 20-mile bike ride, I'm going to tell you right now, you'll never be happy. I'm a lawyer, so let me prove to you beyond a reasonable doubt that I'm right. I want everyone in this room to just close your eyes. And I'm going to ask you some questions. And if you agree with me, I want you to just nod your head, okay? Number one, I know a lot of really, really wealthy people who aren't all that happy, do you? Number two, sometimes isn't the most attractive person in any room the least content inside? Three, you see someone who's really, really popular and you finally get to know them and they don't have all the self-confidence you thought they did. And their life isn't really working out the way they wanted to. We know that this is true. A lady came up to me once, and when you do this as much as I do, you meet people. This lady was really interesting. She said, Corey, um, I raised these dogs, I, I raised these racing greyhounds, just like cash. She said, do you know what happens when the dog figures out that the rabbit is fake? Or God forbid, actually catches one. And I'm like, no, that's awesome, what happens? Tell me. She said, that dog will never run again. You can't get that dog to chase a bone. I find that to be one of the great ironies of human life, don't you? A dog with a hamburger-sized brain realizes what it's chasing is fake, and you can't get it to move. Human beings, us, with the ability to reason, the ability to think, the ability to philosophize, right? We know this stuff won't make us happy, and we continue to chase. So I narrowed life down to three things. Over the last nine years, it took me nine years to figure out what I think people need to chase. Number one contentment in your heart. My question for everyone in this room is this. In the mornings, when you wake up, are you happy with your life? Now, I'm not asking, are you tired, right? Those are two totally different things. Are you happy? See, Time Magazine had a survey, and they asked Americans, they said this, when you wake up in the morning, please identify whether you are happy or not. And 60% of us answered no. In this country, in America, 60% of us answered no. Raise your hand if you've traveled abroad. And the rest of you will. That's why you go to a school like this. Anyone been to Machu Picchu in Peru? Okay, put this thing on your bucket list, right? It's beautiful. This place is awesome. But to get there, it takes two plane rides. It takes a train ride. It takes a cab ride, a bus ride, and then a hike. So give yourself a week, right? But during that trip, we saw Peru. My wife and I like to get into the villages and meet the people. And, you know, she tries to speak Spanish, and I don't know any. And we just like to get in there and, and get a glimpse. And, and we saw Peruvian villages, but to call them villages is an upgrade. These are shanty towns. These are homes without ceilings. People begging in the streets for money and food. They had electricity three hours a day in some of these places. And 60% of us don't wake up happy. That whole trip, all I could say to myself is, Corey, you sure are fortunate, my friend, that you get to wake up every day in America. Am I right? I want you to ask someone in this audience when you get a chance who's from Saudi Arabia, from Shanghai, from Beijing, from Dubai, ask them. Here's what they say to me all the time. Professor C, I love my country. My parents are there. I can't wait to come to America and get my green card. I can't wait to come to America to get a fresh start. And we don't wake up happy. 
My buddy says it better than I do. Billions of people all across this world would love to have your worst day. Right? Me too. So are you content? And if you aren't content, why not chase that? The second thing of three are relationships with other people. You need friends. And you're looking at me now and you're saying, I have friends. Let me be thorough. Here's what happens. College students all across the country come into my office, and it's the absolute worst part of my job. And you're in my office, and you're in tears. And when a big, strong guy is in my office in tears, that rattles me. And here's what you say to me. Professor C, when I was partying, man, everybody loved me. They loved me when I was partying. Every night I partied. Now that I'm an alcoholic, though, now that I'm addicted to drugs, now that I'm anorexic, now that I'm bulimic, now that I got that DUI, now that I got arrested, nobody will talk to me. You know what you say to me next? Professor C, I thought I had more friends than that. And it breaks my heart. And I look back at you and I say, but you're in the student government here. Yeah, those people bailed. You're in a fraternity. Yeah, those guys had better things to do. You're in a sorority. Yeah, those girls, they bailed. You're an RA. Yeah. Adults say the same thing to me. They come in and they say, when I was at my job and I was rolling and getting my bonuses, everybody loved me. Now that I've been laid off, nobody will talk to me. Now that I've foreclosed on my house, I have my family members who won't even look at me. Guess what they say to me next? God, Corey, I thought I had more friends than that, man. <laughs> right. Let me define a friend for you. It's someone who would rush into your life when everybody else rushes out. How many of those do you have? Man, if you could walk out of the doors of this place with three real friends, you have one. See, what did Tiger Woods need more than anything? friend, Charlie Sheen, Lindsay Lohan. They need friends, but guess what? They have everything from worldly standards. Those are attractive people. They are popular, and they are famous, and they are rich. They also have something else in common. They don't wake up happy. They are surrounded by people, though. Tiger Woods was surrounded by people and friendless. Does that describe you? College students, right? You're always surrounded, but are you friendless? Earn those relationships. See, those relationships are earned. Blood, sweat, tears, sitting down, listening to someone, holding them accountable. What should have happened with Tiger Woods is this. If he had a friend, and maybe it happened, we just didn't hear about it. Tiger, you have a beautiful wife, and you have two beautiful kids, and this is your plan? To commit adultery 58 times? This is your plan? See, friends don't just sit there and let their friends drive off a cliff. A friend holds a friend accountable and says, seriously? but you do it with love and you do it with compassion. Call it judging, call it what you want, but if you judge someone with compassion, you're called a friend. If you let someone drive off a cliff and say nothing, you're a sycophant. That's what Tiger Woods had. Fan club, sycophant club, no friends. And the third thing you should chase is character. Contentment, relationships, character, that's it. And if money comes with it, awesome. Think of Thanksgiving, right? You don't go to Thanksgiving for the side dish, but if it comes, that's great. That's what money is. That's what attractiveness is. Let me define character. It's how you act when nobody's looking, right? When you're all alone in that room and you're taking your next test and you could cheat. You have a take-home test. You have a take-home paper. That's when your character really shows. It's how you treat people who can't do anything for you. Everybody's pretty nice to me. I mean, okay, that's kind of easy. How do you treat people that serve you food? Think of the last time you were at a restaurant. Person that changed out your water or cleaned up your plate or took your napkin away. Did you look him in the eyes? Did you look her in the eyes and say thank you? Or just let her take your plate away? I was in a Subway restaurant. I wanted a Subway sandwich. I was just waiting. The line was long. The holdup was this girl. She looked 16. You could tell it was her first job, right? She had three job duties. What kind of sandwich? What kind of bread? Do you want that toasted? Right? It was easy. She wasn't very good at it. Nobody even looked at her because they knew she was the one holding him up. They had other places to go, right? So they got to her and they said, spicy Italian on wheat, whatever. That's what everybody did. So I finally got up to her. She looked like she was ready to cry. And I looked at her and I said, how are you doing? She looks at me and she says, this is my first job. I'm 16. I've been here for two weeks. You're the first person who even looked at me. She goes, I'm doing bad. <laughs> and I'm like, oh gosh, okay. She almost started to cry. And so we commiserated. I told her about my first job, which was cleaning toilets at a health club, you know. And then I finally said to her, I'd like a chicken bacon ranch. I mean, I had to answer the questions. Am I that much better than her? Because she's working at Subway and serving me a sandwich. That I can't look her in the eyes and ask her how she's doing. So before we move on, I just want you to ask yourself this question. 
in your life right now, as a sophomore in college, as a junior, as a senior in college, as a member of our community, what do you chase? Man, is it real or is it fake? Are you happy or not? Do you wake up in the morning with contentment? Do you have good friends who would be there for you? What do you chase? So here's my advice. Let's say you believe me and you think that I'm right and you want to start being a better person. How do you do it? I'm going to give you a couple ways tonight. The rest will be learned in your classes and just the hard knocks of life, right? But here are my ways tonight. Number one is you can't rely on luck for anything anymore. Have you heard that Bon Jovi song, Living on a Prayer? <laughs> it's a good song, right? That is terrible life advice. I'm a religious guy. I have a master's degree in religious studies. I don't know one religion that says you just live like this and you'll be okay, man. No. But students, you do this all the time. Let me just go on to rate my professors and find the easiest class and I'll just get through this, right? Oh, let me, uh, let me not do the reading for this class and hopefully the professor won't call on me. If I could just skip tomorrow and there happens to be something that it just won't be on the test, right? When I walk out of these doors in two years or whatever that is, I'll get a job, it'll be okay. I graduated from DU. <laughs> I know that's what a lot of you are thinking. It'll be okay. Living on a prayer, man. Adults do this too. If only the stock market would go up. My 401k would go up and I could retire. If only my boss saw how hard I really worked, I'd get that promotion, right? Just, if only. Here's the thing about luck, and you know this as well as I do. It exists. It exists in good, and it exists in bad, but the problem is you can't control it. And in life, you want to control stuff, right? You have to control what happens to you as much as you can, and if you just do this, you leave it to fate. And the worst thing that could happen to you is you, once in a while you get lucky, because then you think it'll keep happening. I'm going to show you this video. I want you to watch this video. This will change the way you look at life. I hope it does. We had uh, planned to bring you a story tonight about a kind of prep school that prepares football players for the NFL draft and big contracts. But we're going to call an audible. We're going to switch sports tonight because we've run across an absolutely amazing basketball player that we want you to see. Here's Steve Hartman. Greece Athena High School in Rochester, New York, has a new, most unlikely hero, a special ed student by the name of Jason McElwain. Let's keep it going. Jason is the basketball team manager. For the past couple years, he's been assisting coach Jim Johnson, helping with right, whatever the team ready needs. And go! Get him motivated and uh, hand out water and just be enthusiastic. Enthusiastic, to say the least. Despite being born with autism, Jason's father says his son has never had a problem expressing himself at basketball games. You know, I was always concerned that he might get a technical and they lose a game because he, you know, start yelling or whatever. Let's have a hard practice tomorrow, all hour and a half, and let's get ready for Arcadia. Okay. Let's go. One, two, three, two. Because he has been so devoted to the team, for the last game of the season, Coach Johnson decided to let Jason actually suit up. Not to play necessarily, just to let him feel what it's like to wear a jersey. At least that was the plan. But with four minutes to go in last week's game, Coach Johnson stood up and pointed to number 52, Jason McElwain. After years of fetching water and toweling off other people's sweat, Jason was actually in a game. His first shot was a 20-footer from the right baseline. Was it close? Did you almost make I just, it? I just airballed it. <laughs> I'm like, just, dear God, please, let's just get him a basket. His second shot missed, too. But the third was a charm. A three-point no-doubter. And Jason wasn't done yet. Not by a long shot. If I wasn't there to witness it, I wouldn't have believed it, you know? You caught fire. I just caught fire. I was hot as a pistol. Jason ended up shooting six three-pointers. One right after the other. He had 20 points total, and each time a shot went in, his teammates and the crowd went a little crazier. His last basket, right at the buzzer, created total mayhem. Because he is autistic, Jason says he's used to feeling different, but never this different, never this wonderful. Steve Hartman, CBS News, Rochester, New York. Raise your hand if you're crying. <laughs> it's okay. Raise your hand if that gave you goosebumps. And I'm going to say something the rest of you aren't going to like. If you can watch that and not cry and or get goosebumps, there's something wrong with you as a human being. <laughs> I'm sorry. If you can watch that and that doesn't emotionally stir you, where are you? Right? 
This kid goes to the White House and meets the president. It was George W. Bush. As they shake hands, the president starts to cry. Can you imagine going to the White House and making the president cry in a good way, <laughs> right? The pres if I was president, I'd cry every day in a bad way, like it's all going to hell, you know? <laughs> That job sucks, doesn't it, right? He goes to the White House and he makes the president cry tears of joy. There's a book and a movie to be made of his life, but I took something else from the story. The media descends on this little town. It wasn't like it was here Wednesday for the presidential debate, but the media was there and they wanted to talk to this kid and they wanted to interview them. And I kept saying to myself, don't do it, don't do it, don't do it. Every time the media wants to interview me, I try to avoid it. Because by the time the article comes out, I'm picking my nose and I'm misquoted and I look dumb, right? I'm like, don't do it, kid but he wants to be on TV. So they interview him and they say, Jason, kid, you sure got lucky. And I'm like, here we go. Kid says, he answers it perfectly. He goes, I don't know, maybe I did. All I did was go to practice every single day and try as hard as I could, just in case coach put me in. I was like, yes, that's an awesome attitude about life, isn't it? See, if you know anything about basketball, if that kid goes out there and misses that fourth shot, that third and fourth shot, he's out, man, that's the hook. And maybe he has a story to tell his family. But he didn't miss, did he? He kept making it and making it and breaking records. And now he's a national spokesperson for autism. Why? Because he earned it. He, he just earned it. And my advice to you is you need to start earning things. You need to earn everything in your life. And if you get lucky, cool. And if you don't, it doesn't matter because you'll get there anyway because you've earned it, right? Let me tell you what I can't promise you. If you start earning things, and here's what I can't promise you. I can't promise you a job. I can't promise you that you'll never get laid off. I can't promise you that you won't get cancer or that someone in your family won't get into a car accident. I can't promise you that because, huh, that's life. I get it, right? But here's what I can promise you, and it's the only thing I can, that when life kicks you, you will land on your feet. And that's all you can ask out of life, I think. I'm really tired of people coming up to me and saying, Professor C, it's just not fair. Life's not fair. When people say that to me, I look at them and I say, okay, we'll do this, go home. Get the contract that you signed with life. Go get it, bring it to me. The piece of paper that says, I life, promise you, Frank, that it will be fair, bring it to me. He looks at me and says, I don't have one. I know, right? Mark Twain says it better. He says, don't go walking around like the world owes you anything. It was here first, <laughs> right? And that's true. We don't need to be entitled. We need to be earning. So let me ask you a question at the practices of your life. Behind the scenes, when you're studying for your tests, when you're with your friends, right? Are you earning it? Are you earning your knowledge? Are you earning your relationships? Are you just memorizing and regurgitating? Are you taking the easiest classes possible just to get your degree and get through? Are you winging it? Or are you trying to earn it? What I would do at a school like this is not take the hardest classes. That's a mistake. I would find the best professors and I would follow them around this campus. As many as you can. And I would sit in those classes and I would learn from those people, and I would earn my knowledge. That's what you need to do. No more luck, no more hoping it works out, because it probably won't. <laughs> this economy is getting worse, worse, worse. Unemployment rate, right, it just fluctuates between eight and 12% hurts you the worst, because you come out of here without any experience, and you shouldn't, there's no reason you'd have any, but people with experience are gonna get the jobs that you don't get. All right, I'm gonna tell you some words I want you to think about every single day, because that takes a long time. Starting to earn things takes time. I stole this idea from Jimmy Valvano. Does anyone know that name? Any basketball fans in here? Jimmy Valvano was a neat guy. He died of cancer. As he was dying, he was sort of dying this public death. Everyone was following him around with cameras because he was so charismatic. He won an SB. And if you like sports, you've seen the ESPYs. It's on ESPN. He gets up there and he wins a Sportsman of the Year Lifetime Achievement Award, right? So he goes up stage and he's hobbled, right, because he's weak. And he gets behind his little podium and he has his speech and he's ready to talk and he sits there. And if you've watched the Grammys, you have 30 seconds to deliver this, right? 30 seconds, and then it's lights, music, stage left. But Google this. Jimmy Vavano sits up there for 11 and a half minutes, talking, talking, talking. And the whole time, ESPN is flashing this red light. Dude, stop. We have to go to commercials. And Jimmy V, like a good Italian, says, I have tumors all over my body. Do you think I care about your commercials? I was like, yes, now what happens? What does ESPN do? Do they go to commercial or do they stick with the dying guy? <laughs> what do you do? You stick with the dying guy, option two, right? And you need to YouTube this because he gives one of the most eloquent, most beautiful speeches I've ever heard in my life. And I do this for a living and I've listened to a lot of speeches. 
And he's up there and he says, every human being every day should do three things. He said, if you do these three things, man, you have a full life. Number one, you should think every day. Number two, you should laugh every day. Number three, you should have your emotions stirred every day. Let me ask you a question. Do you think every day? Or do you memorize and regurgitate every day, right? Do you phone it in? And you all know what I mean by phoning it in. I could walk into class. I've taught Legal Studies 2000 so many times. Man, I could walk in there, we could BS about healthcare, and I could leave, and you wouldn't know the difference, and I'd have phoned it in to you. You don't want me to do that. But do you phone in your reading assignments, your homework assignments, your internships? Do you phone it in at work, right? Let me tell you what's never gonna happen in your life. Your boss is never gonna walk up to you, not once, and hand you a stack of papers and say, read this. I'm gonna come back at five. I need you to memorize it, and I need you to give me a reading comprehension analysis. Never. She's gonna walk up to you, she's gonna hand you a stack of papers, and she's gonna say, read this, and I'm gonna come back at five. And if you can give me a good old-fashioned piece of advice, I don't have to lay off 25 people tomorrow, so can you help me? Why do you go to a school like this? Why do you pay all the money you pay to sit in these seats so that you can learn how to think. I know a lot of people with four O's who aren't all that smart, do you? Grades follow knowledge, or at least they should. Every single person in this room should be able to tell me where the Dow Jones Industrial Average closed today within 1,000 points. You should. You should be able to articulate to me what's happening in Syria and Afghanistan and China, between China and Japan. You should be able to articulate that to me. That's why you sit in these seats. See, I talk to inner city high school kids all the time. There are some here tonight. Thank you for coming. I love it. These kids say to me, Professor C, I would love to go to DU, but I can't. For whatever reason, my dad's in jail. My mom's addicted to drugs. I don't know. I have an arrest record. I don't have good enough grades. I can't go, but I would love to go sit in a seat. And here you sit in a seat. See, you're here. You're taking up a seat that one of those kids would love to have. What are you doing with your seat? What are you doing here? Because I can name a thousand people that I've talked to over the last three years who would sit where you sit. Might change your attitude about the ethics boot camp a little bit, right? Because you're in a seat. You're here. You need to think every single day. And then he said, laugh. We'll come back to that because I made that on my list too. And then he said, you should have your emotions stirred. And what I think he meant by that was you should get goosebumps every day. Do you? I mean, do you really get goosebumps? Does something give you goosebumps every day? Now, women, you're good at this. It's in your DNA. At this point in the talk, all the men look at me and say, you're already doing it. Dude, no. I'm a man. Get goosebumps? No. I'm way too cool for that. I'm going to ask you a question, and I want to see if you agree with me. I believe we're losing our young men in this country. Do you agree? We're losing our young men, and I can prove it to you. Average GPA for a college female is 3.2. Average GPA for a college male is 2.7. All across the country, outside of the statistical margin of error. I went to a Future Business Leaders of America conference. There were 18 executive positions, 17 of which were filled by women. One guy just following them around. <laughs> Luckiest guy ever, right? I said to these women, I'm like, where are all the men? What's going on? This is stupid. She said, we can't get a man to join this group to save our lives. I spoke at Loyola, Chicago, incoming class, 65% women, 35% men. If you look at DU, it's 55% women, 45% men, a total 180 change from the last 10 years. I look at my classes, and I just pray that it's the same. At the top of my classes, it's always the same, right? But over the last 10 years, if I did a moving average, I would put women in percentage point 2 to 12, maybe 14, and then the young men come in other than at the top. Guys, why? Why did this happen? I think I know why, because my dad did this to me. My dad didn't say much to me, but what he did say to me was, Corey, be tough, and if you're tough, you're a man. That's all he ever said to me. So we were playing basketball, and I'd get hurt. He'd say, get up. Dad, I broke my ankle. Get up, right? Shake it off. And if you have a dad like that, right? That's all he ever said to me. So when I was in high school, man, I looked for guys who were tough. Those were my friends. Guys who didn't give a damn. But if we got into a fight, we would win. Who could slam dunk a basketball, man? Who could bench press the most weight? Those were my friends. Guess what the last thing we ever talked about was? Future business leaders of America. <laughs> Never came up once. 
Not once that I want to involve myself in a student group. I went into class, and just like you all do, I sat in the back, as far back as I could. Guys, let me say something to you. We can't afford to lose you, and I think you have all the potential in the world. I have a soft spot in my heart for you, man. I, we need you to catch up. But I'll say this to you, I respect a man who's tough. I respect a man who is mentally and physically strong. I respect that man, but let me tell you something, I respect you more if you're also emotional. If you look at men, ask yourself the men in your life who you think have life figured out, I promise you those are emotional men. Men who have life figured out get pretty emotional, don't they? Jimmy Valvano, if you like football, Dick Vermeil. Dick Vermeil is a famous, tough football coach. Right? Peyton Manning, when he came to Denver, did you see that press conference? He's sitting up there in tears. Pretty tough man. His billionaire owner is sitting next to him in tears about football. If you watch the president go down to Tucson, Arizona, he was memorializing and eulogizing people that died when the congresswoman was shot. And he's giving this eulogy, and it's beautiful, and he's sitting there, and halfway through, he just stops. Anybody see this? For like 30 seconds, he stopped, and it was awkward, right? He was ready to cry. And I'm like, please cry. <laughs> you know, that would be awesome because I could show the clip at Ethics Boot Camp. <laughs> and he held it together. He held it together. But only men in this room, let me ask you a question. Men only. Would any of you men have begrudged our president for crying when an 11-year-old girl was assassinated? Anyone? When George W. Bush got on top of that fire truck after 9-11, took that megaphone and started to cry. Guys, did you have a problem with that? I guess what I'm saying to you is once you start to figure out life, you'll start caring more. So start figuring it out now. When a man figures out his life, he becomes emotional. He treats women with respect. He walks into class and he gives a damn. We need you guys. Okay, go like this. You're done. Whew. Women, your turn. You still face a glass ceiling. My wife is one of three female surgeons in the North Denver area. There are three female surgeons in North Denver. That's crazy. She walks into the operating room and they say, this is a tough case, better bring the boys in. She walks in to see the patients and they say, are you the nurse? She went to Cornell Medical School. She had a job interview once and this guy asked her, what are your plans for your uterus? I teach employment law. If there was a list of top 10 most illegal employment law questions, <laughs> that would be number two, followed by what he asked her next. Well, tell me when you're ready to be sterilized and we have a job for you. And she, she's tough. She's used to it. That really makes me mad. But women, let me tell you something. If she can do that, I mean, I'm just going to embarrass you. She grew up with nothing. Nothing. Broken home. Not a lot of money, right? Public schools, not much. Just a really smart brain. If she can go to Cornell Medical School, women, so can you. So can you. If she can make it in life, women, so can you. You have no excuses. But you have to work harder than we do. You just do. Women, the studies show that you are equally likely as we are to try dangerous and addictive substances. So we're equally likely to try them, but you're more likely to become addicted. You're more likely to have an eating problem, a psychological problem, social problems stemming from that. So women, you have that. Women, too many of you come up to me and say, there's just no good men out there. <laughs> you know you say it, right? You're giving me an economics argument, right? You're saying there's a lack of supply of good men. <laughs> what I want to argue to you is there's a lack of demand for good men. We're simple creatures. <laughs> you tell us to do something, we will. Right? When I first met my wife, she said, Corey, I need you to do X, Y, Z. And I did it immediately because I thought she was pretty and I didn't want her to break up with me. <laughs> you let us be morons and we will. Women, demand more of us and we'll be better. And last, women, the way you handle drama is awful. <laughs> I'm sorry. Guys go like this. Dude, stop being such an idiot. Boom. We punch each other when we move on. You hold grudges. You gossip, you talk behind each other's backs, you steal each other's stuff. Why? I've never stole something of my guy buddies like, dude, I've had your t-shirt for like a year here, sorry. <laughs> Am I stereotyping? Yes. Am I right? Yes. <laughs> so I took Jimmy Valvano's list and I changed it. Why? Because you all are being called the lost generation. Did you know that? People aged 18 to 26 are being called lost. There was a Wall Street Journal article about you, and this is what it read. These kids are lost. They are lazy, weak, apathetic. 
They will live with their parents till they're 28. <laughs> Some of you are like, that's the plan. No. <laughs> That's not me saying that. I'm just reading the Wall Street Journal, right? That's not some whacked out blog. That's our nation's leading business newspaper. Raise your hand if that makes you mad. And if you didn't raise your hand, you're part of the problem. <laughs> I mean, right? If someone said that about my generation, I'd be pissed. Call me lazy? Call me weak? Call me apathetic? No, I'm not. What they're basically saying about you is you have Ferrari brains, that you're driving like scooters. <laughs> I love my job. I don't need to do this. My wife is rich. <laughs> I d I <laughs> and I'm not embarrassed to say it. I do this job because I believe in you. I believe in you. I believe in our future. I love my country. I want my country to look like it did when I grew up. I do this job. We have Would it have been easier for us to not run an ethics boot camp? Yes. We do this because we believe in you. You can't be a lost generation. We can't afford it. Social Security is going to run out of money in 2037. Medicare is going to run out of money in 2024. Medicaid is going to run out of money in 2017. Gone. No money. Insolvent. But in this country, we don't let things like that go broke, so we bail them out. We bail them out with your money. I read something today that in order to pay off all this, to get these things back to even, your tax rate in 2040 is going to be 75% of income. See, you're walking into that world. We can't have you be lost. That should make you really, really mad. So I changed his list because you got to know it. You need to hustle more. Now, I grew up in a bad neighborhood, right? I didn't go to the best schools. In my neighborhood, that word had a different meaning. <laughs> Any of you from my neighborhood, right? But if you look it up in the dictionary, that word is beautiful. It means you should try harder than you are currently trying. Could you? In school, in your relationships, in your relationships with your friends, your significant other, and your parents, right? Could you be better? We all could. But you all are part of the self-esteem movement, and this isn't your fault. It's the one time tonight I'm going to let you off the hook. This is the thing where everybody gets a ribbon. Everybody gets an A. Everybody wins. Nobody loses. My wife's high school in the last couple years had like 27 valedictorians, making it almost meaningless, Right? Raise your hand if you went to a school that had a field day, elementary school. Raise your hand if everyone got a ribbon, even if you finished last. Okay, put them down. You're embarrassing yourself. I went to Pittsburgh, Duquesne University in Pittsburgh. This girl comes up to me. Out of her purse, she pulls out this ribbon, and it was huge. And on it, it said, 12th place, winner. <laughs> I looked at her, and I said, you're a loser. I don't even know her. She goes, yeah, I am. I said, I'm talking about this race. In this race, you are the loser of all the losers. And she goes, well, if you want to put it like that. And I said, how many were in the race? And she goes, 12. And I said, let's put it like that, right? I said, did you show this to your parents? She goes, I would never show this to my parents. I want everyone in this room to ask yourself what your grandfather, we all have a nice grandpa and a mean one, right? What would your mean grandpa do if you walked home and showed him a 12th place ribbon? I'll just tell you how it would have gone in my house, okay, with my dad. Son, what is that in your hand? Oh, Dad, that's my ribbon from field day. What, what place did you get? Twelve. Boom. And then he would have had a follow-up question for me. Corey, how many kids were in that race? Uh, Dad, there were twelve. Boom. Now, I'm not advocating that you hit your kids. That's legally and ethically suspect, right? But if your kid brings home a twelfth place ribbon, the last place that belongs is on the fridge. You know that, right? And if your kid finishes in 12th place in every single race, you should consider holding him back a grade. <laughs> Go win something like the beanbag toss or finish 11th. Here's the thing. Let me tell you how this plays out. My class is about four years ago. I used to give two essays. That was the entire grade in the class, two essays. My teaching philosophy, those of you who have me know, is garbage in, garbage out. You know this, right? You give me garbage, your grade will be garbage. You're starting to realize this. Well, so I, two essays, I got my essays in, I had two classes, I had 80 students, I'm reading these things, and they are utter garbage. This was the best day of my teaching career. I took a red pen, and I gave every single kid the biggest F I could, and I handed the papers back. Now, you're at DU, you all have never even seen an F, right? So you get your papers back, and you're like, what the hell is this, an L? That's what they were doing. My paper wasn't late. Professor C, what's wrong? And I said, these papers are terrible. And they said to me, terrible's a B. I mean, when I do terribly, it's a B, right? I taught a PMBA class this summer, and every single person in the room had above a 3.7, right? So maybe terrible is a B. 
I said, not in my class, let's go through the scale. A is excellent, B is above average, C is average, D is below average, here's your F, <laughs> right? So they're mad, they don't really like me. And I don't really like them either, right? That's the beauty of a 10 week quarter. If you don't like me, you're gone in 10 weeks, right? Fine, I said, I can't wait to read your next essays. So they're mad. So I get the next set of essays back and I'm ready to give more Fs, man, I'm ready. But I'm reading these things and they're beautiful. I mean, they're just beautiful. Grammatically, it's solid. They actually had a thesis statement that they carried to a logical conclusion, right? I'm reading these things and I'm thinking, I can't give these kids anything other than an A. It's the only time I've ever done this. I've never done it before, never done it since. I give every single student an A. And I handed back your papers and I said, well, let me get this straight. You can get an A anytime you want. It just takes an F to make you mad enough. You know what you said to me? That's right, professor, because it averages to a C and we pass. That should break your heart. That should break your heart that kids say that. Because here's what you're saying to me. Professor, see, my whole life, if I just showed up, I got a ribbon, man. So if you would just shut up and give me my C, I can move on to accounting. And I'll get a C there because I can pass with a C. And then I'll move on to finance. You know? And then I'll get out of here and I'll be okay. I'll take over my parents' business. And I'll run it right into the ground. The movie theater shooting that we all witnessed was the one time in my life I looked at tragedy and I thought, there's not one thing I would have wanted my government to have done differently. That was gonna happen. Now there's things that kid's parents should have done differently and his teachers and whatever, but the cops were taking these wounded people, putting them in the front of patrol cars, which violates all the rules in the world, and rushing them to the hospital. You see, here's the thing. Aren't you glad that night that every single one of those people was giving an A? I mean, aren't you glad that night that those people decided to hustle and not phone it in like always? That was awesome. I'm really glad. Here's the thing I want you to know. If you remember nothing else from tonight, remember this. You don't just turn this stuff on and off like a switch, guys. You don't just start giving a damn when you graduate or become a cop or become a nurse or a doctor or a firefighter. You don't just start caring. There's no switch, right? The switch is now, and it's a long-term thing. What does Aristotle say? You are the sum total of your habitual actions. So your habitual actions now will matter when someone needs them later. There's no switch. You need to hustle more. If you don't turn in a paper that deserves an A, take your C and do better next time. Don't be happy with your C. But don't expect an A either. Just hustle, try as hard as you can. The next word is to fight for things that matter. Let me ask you a question. If I asked you what you fight for right now, would you be able to tell me? And don't say breast cancer awareness. No, you don't. Don't say my fraternity fights for this. Well, that's true, but ask your philanthropy chair how hard it is to get people to that. What do you really, really, really fight for? What do you care about? Here's the thing. You got your little box. You got your little Real Rabbits Challenge box, don't you? We've decided to fight for something at DU. I've handed that box out to my classes for the last five terms, five quarters. And I hand you the box, and I say, we're going to raise some money for some inner city kids. And you don't have to do it, but you can if you want. And every time you act with integrity, I want you to put a dime in that little box. Don't put more than a dime, or you're going to ruin my experiment. Just put a dime. Carry that around campus with you, okay? And if you see your friends doing good, I want you to tell your friends to put a dime in there. Just do that. And at the end of the quarter, we'll just add up all these dimes, and we'll give them to these kids at West High School and see if we can start to change their lives. And I've done that for the last five terms. And we've raised 50,000 times for inner city schools. I didn't raise one of them. I just handed you a box. And I just encouraged you to fight for something. See, you want to use your brains. You don't want another iPhone app, another X game, a Xbox game. You want to fight. So you have your boxes. And you have some kids from West High School here tonight. Let's fill them up. Let's let them buy computers so that they can apply to college. That was the point. So last time we gave bikes to this elementary school. We, we gave money and they were gonna buy bikes for themselves. Watch what happened. Hi, my name is Tori. I am a student at Acres Green Elementary School in Littleton. Miss Tanner's three fourth grade class was chosen by Dr. Chiquetti's ethics class at DU in Denver to receive a donation. We are so excited to have the opportunity to receive this money and pass it to worthy causes de dear to our hearts. Our plan is to give a portion of the money to our library at Acres Green, to the rainforest rescue that saves acres in Brazil, and also to the inner city health center for their kids bike fair. Every year, my family and I go to schools in our neighborhood and ask for a donation of bikes. 
After we get the bikes, they are fixed up at the shop downtown and are made ready for the new for their new life with kids that have never had a bike. We go to one inner city school each year and give away the bikes at our kids fair. I have been I have seen kids have such a big smile on their faces when they get their bikes and they just can't stop riding their new bikes. We are grateful that we can help others with the help of Dr. Chiquetti's class. They have helped us be better citizens of the world. There's your goosebumps moment number two. Notice they didn't say thanks to me. They said thanks to you. See, these kids are broke. They could have taken the money and used it on themselves, but they bought bikes for poorer kids. Let me go through some statistics with you. See, we bring them onto campus to receive the money. We don't just give them dimes. We give them a check. That would be awkward, right? Here's 50,000 dimes. Enjoy it. Right? Take that home on the light rail. So the studies show that if you bring an inner city kid to a college campus, that kid is 90% more likely to go to college. Why are they here tonight? Listen to me, high school kids, you're gonna go to college. And it may be here, and it may not. And it may be at the community college down the street. And I don't care, but you're here so you can soak this up with us. But you're here because these kids in this room are raising dimes to bring you here. You know that, right? These kids took the money and they bought bikes for poorer kids, paid it forward, right? Just with dimes. Each dime representing something good that you did. So what do you fight for? The third word is to listen. Each of you in this room has two ears, but you only have one mouth. So anatomically, you should listen twice as much as you speak. Do you? Every business study I've ever read says to move up in any organization, it becomes more and more crucial to listen. Every study I've also read says that once you get to the top, you stop listening. <laughs> You'll see that when you get your jobs. People ahead of me, they don't listen to me all that often. I mean, I get it right, but the th they got there by listening. Let me ask you a question. Raise your hand if you thanked a professor this week. 25% maybe. My students like me. I mean, I think my students really like me. If you go on Rate My Professors, you can see that, whatever that's worth. But after class, they just kind of leave. Six years ago, I had a kid named Kyle Lewis. You might know Kyle. He was on our basketball team. Neat, neat kid. He was our point guard. After every class, everyone else would leave. Kyle would come up, and as hard as he could, he would hit me. Good job, Professor C. Boom. And it would hurt. I was a strong kid. So by the 20th class, I saw him coming. Everyone else was gone. And I'm like, ha <laughs> What's up, Kyle? There's no one else in the room. I said, hey, man, do you want to be a lawyer? He looks at me and he goes, no. I said, oh. I said, why are you in this class? He goes, it's required. Okay, Kyle, buzzkill, man. Why are you hitting me? He goes, Professor C, I don't want to be a lawyer. He goes, I see how much enthusiasm you bring to this thing, though, man. I see how much you care about me, and this is the way an 18-year-old guy says I'm listening. Boom, and he hit me and left. Here's something really interesting, though. That was six years ago. I had 240 students that year, and I remember the name of one. Who? Kyle Lewis. I'm going to write a letter of recommendation for one student and only one that year, because that's the only kid I know, Kyle Lewis, and I'll get him into Harvard. If Kyle Lewis ever wants a letter of recommendation from me, it'll be 10 pages long. It's the only kid I know from that year. How long do you think it took Kyle to walk up to me, hit me and leave, cumulatively how long? Five seconds. I'll remember that kid till the day I die. I I've spoken that kid's name to a million people. If your professors are bad here, don't thank them. <laughs> I'm a huge fan of the meritocracy. But if your professors are good, if you have Professor Holt, Professor Cassidy, Professor Elias, they care a lot about you, don't hit them, all right? Walk up and shake their hand and say thank you. Just say thank you. You're not entitled to a good professor. You're entitled to an education here. You're not entitled to a good professor, right? Those are two different things, so thank them. The last word is to laugh. Let's come full circle. Jimmy Valvano said every day you should think and laugh and have your emotions stirred, and I agree, so it makes my list too. We take ourselves way too seriously as a society, though. And I know why we do, because the economy is terrible. There are no jobs, and it's all, it's all coasting downhill in a bad way. But here's the thing. I'm going to talk to you about stress tomorrow. And what I've learned about stress is, if you don't find a way to laugh at yourself, you're going to run right into a life crisis. Go to the counseling center and ask them why kids drop out of school. Kids drop out of school because their stress level gets so high and they have not an ability to laugh at themselves and boom. Why do adults go into a midlife crisis? They take themselves way too seriously and boom, the stress overwhelms them. 
But I want you to make this very clear. <laughs> Laugh at yourself, not at others. I woke up one morning. There were two medical studies on my desk. My wife had written, read this and read this. So when your wife writes that, what do you do? You read it. So the first one proved that if people that laugh at themselves live longer, healthier, happier lives. Do you believe that? Totally, right? There was a footnote that said, if you laugh at others, you don't get these benefits. Karma, right? Karma. There was also a farting study. <laughs> I don't want to read it. I don't, but she said read it, right? So I read it. They gave people some money. And they told them to walk around the community and count the amount of times every day they farted. Would you take that money? Free money, right? The number is 14. <laughs> Everyone in this room farts 14 times a day. And I'm looking at all the guys now. They're like, dude, yeah, I just farted now. <laughs> that was awesome. I talk to these hedge fund guys. These guys are like, well, I'm twice the man, 14. I'm twice that man. <laughs> That's terrible. But women, you're looking at me like, not me. Uh-uh, not me. Let me pick on someone. What's your name? Hi, Darcy, stand up. <laughs> Never sit up front again, Darcy. Huge mistake. Look how cute. Everyone look how pretty Darcy is. You fart 14 times a day, girl. <laughs> it's 6.15 right now. You probably farted 10 times, huh? Darcy, you got four more to go, girl. <laughs> She's like, I hate him. Let me ask you a question. How dare you sit in this room and fart and not laugh at my jokes? If you haven't laughed at me once and a couple of you are out there, don't you dare fart. You hold it. Right? <laughs> if you fart, man, you cannot take yourself too seriously. So I want everyone in this room to think back to the dumbest thing you've ever done. For some of you, that happened way too fast. She's like, it was last night. <laughs> and the cops were there. We'll talk later, okay? <laughs> Here's mine. And I can never take myself too seriously. If you ever see me in the halls taking myself too seriously, don't let me, because I've done two really dumb things. I ironed my own neck. <laughs> don't judge me yet. I had a suit on. I had a tie on. I was going to a job interview. I was looking really good, I thought, right? But there was a wrinkle in my collar. And guys, we've all been there. Normally, you take your suit jacket and you just kind of go like this and hope it covers it up. But it didn't. But I didn't have time to take my shirt off. I was late. I could take my tie off, take my shirt off. Forget about it. So I plugged the iron in. That's smart, I think. At this point, all the guys are like, that's so stupid, dude. You're supposed to put a towel under there. <laughs> and the women are like, no, that's stupid, too. Take your shirt off because irons are... Hot. Yeah, she hates me. <laughs> I didn't have a woman there to tell me to take my shirt off, and I didn't know the towel trick. So I'm doing great, I'm doing great, I'm doing great, and it slips. And it hurt. And it started to bleed. And it looked like I tried to kill myself. It did. So I took a washcloth. I had to still go to the interview, right? Have you ever been driving after doing something really stupid? And I was like, put it over my artery or whatever that is. <laughs> tell me later what that is. It wasn't good. It was bleeding. And I'm like this. Oh, you're such an idiot, Corey. You don't deserve to get this job. How did you get through law school? You should drive right into a curb. <laughs> <laughs> Terrible mental state to go into my interview, right? So I get off at the Tabor Center downtown. I get off on whatever, the 14th floor, and a couple partners are there ready to meet me. And they said, hi, Corey, how you doing? And I said, hi. They said, what'd you do this morning? Try to kill yourself? <laughs> awesome. My job interview just started like that. That's terrific. But I can't tell that man the truth. No, sir, kill myself. That would be stupid. I ironed myself this morning. I mean, right? I make good decisions like this all the time. <laughs> can't say that. Please hire me for your mergers and acquisitions. I can't say that. So I lied. I had a bunch of lies ready. You've all done it like a stack of lies. So I said, no, sir, that's just acne. <laughs> Which I think is a really good lie, don't you? He looks at me and he goes, well, why is it bleeding all over your shirt? I've never seen acne bleed. Have you ever run out of lies? I had a lie for a lot of responses, but not that. And I'm like, I don't know, I ironed myself. Oh, God. <laughs> I did not get that job. About four years later, I'm pulling off of this campus, okay? And there's a bee in my car. Ever had a bee in your car? Because I can assure you that'll be one of the worst days of your life. Believe me. Who here is scared of bees? Is anyone scared and not allergic? Where? <laughs> anyone? Bueller? Someone has to be. Raise your hand really high so I can see you. All right. Oh, awesome. Adam, hi. We're just whips, okay? So I said to my wife, and she knows how scared I am. She go, I said, honey, oh, my God, there's a bee in my car. It's going to kill me. Aren't these things supposed to die and come back to life in the spring? <laughs> I was never very good at gnats, right? She goes, Corey, calm down. Roll down your window and knock the thing out with your hand. Adam, would you do that? 
there's no way in hell, right? And I'm like, um, no. She goes, you know what, Corey? I can't help you anymore. Click. Huh. I'm like, I don't need her. I don't. I love her. I don't need her. I went to law school. <laughs> right? If I can't solve this problem, I can't do anything. I'm like, okay, she's right. I'm going to roll down my window. That's smart. And then I looked around my car for a weapon, <laughs> which I didn't have because I don't live in North Carolina anymore. Any of you from the South? If you're from the South, y'all have weapons. Okay, believe me. But I don't. I'm in Colorado. So I'm looking around. And by the way, this is happening fast. When I ironed my neck, it happened fast. The dumbest thing you ever did, if it took like three days, you're an idiot, right? It goes fast. So I'm like, okay, here's my wallet. <laughs> That's right. So I picked it up and I went like this. <laughs> that isn't gonna work. It looked like I had Parkinson's or something. Like, this is not good. Now the thing is alert and it's looking at me with its beady little eyes, making you nervous right now. Oh, Adam, this is terrible. So I'm like, I'm gonna get this thing as hard as I could. It's, it's coming at me. Shoo! I let go of my wallet and I threw it out the window of my car. That wouldn't have been rolled down if you didn't tell me to. As it flies out the window, I see the light to I-25 turn green. <laughs> Crap. So I did a cost-benefit analysis. I put my business degree to work, right? Option one, you could drive on, Corey, as if that never happened. <laughs> and I thought long and hard about number one. Option two, you get out of your car, you look like a moron, you hold all these people up, and you get it. What's the answer? Some of you are like, I don't know. No, it's two. <laughs> it's not number one. So I get out. These people here could go because the light is green. Nobody went anywhere. They're like, let's see what this idiot does next. <laughs> let's just see what has like reality TV, right? So I get out of my car. I'm now standing up. What do you do when someone gets out of his car at an intersection? Yeah, everyone's like, screw you, man. Urgh, you're an idiot. And I'm like, no, screw you. <laughs> and you and you and you. And I'm the ethics professor. <laughs> And I'm one block from campus. I can just see you guys like, is that Professor C? Cussing those guys out? The hell? So I get out of my car. I cross university. It's a pretty busy street. I go to pick this thing up, and my back goes, because I'm old, right? I now have a problem. <laughs> I sit down. I look at the light. It's now red. Nobody has moved. I'm like, I'm going to lock my doors. But they can still see me. I look up at my steering wheel, and the B is still in there. <laughs> right where it was, and then it just flew out the window. Y'all, listen to me. I can never take myself seriously again. I ironed my neck and threw my wallet out of a parked car, okay? <laughs> but you've done stuff like that too. A lot of life and a lot of being human is kind of celebrating when we screw up, not celebrating when other people screw up. Let's conclude. I'm asking you to do a lot. Why? Why do it? I mean, what, who cares, Professor C? Well, I'll tell you why I think you should do it. I believe if you do this, you'll wake up a more content human being. I also believe that, that everyone in this room has a moral obligation to pay the message forward of what it means to have integrity. Raise your hand if you know another person who you wish would have been here tonight to hear this. Guys, I can't tell that many people. You have to tell them. You can steal every story you want. They're not mine. <laughs> I stole them from John Bogle. And the one, the dumb ones about me, steal them. I don't care. Just tell them. Just tell them why. Here's the thing. Here's life. On the left is what I call authentic success. Right? Chasing the right things. Just giving a damn about things that really matter. Contentment, relationships, character. Honesty, compassion, loyalty. On the right is blue, not interested, or moral relativism. And the idea with moral relativism is don't tell me how to act, Professor C. This is my life, right? And in the middle is you. That took me an hour to draw on my Mac. I hope you appreciate that. <laughs> it's supposed to be easier on a Mac, right? Which way do you go, my friend? I know a lot of people in the blue circle. I've spent a lot of my life in the blue circle. And let me tell you something. Those were some of the most miserable years of my life. When I didn't care about being good, when I didn't care about anything, I was in the blue, and I was miserable. And I'm not telling you right now that I'm in the red. I'm just telling you that I'm seeking the red. It's kind of like Aristotle would say, you just seek. Just seek the golden mean. Just seek to be good, and then you'll be happier. You don't have to get there. You may never get there. Just seek it. I'm going to show you this video. I'm going to dim the lights. I'm going to show you this video. Then I'm going to tell you two things, and we'll be done. I am part of a lost generation, and I refuse to believe that I can change the world. I realize this may be a shock, but happiness comes from within is a lie, and money will make me happy. So in 30 years, I will tell my children they are not the most important thing in my life. 
My employer will know that I have my priorities straight because work is more important than family. I tell you this, once upon a time, families stayed together. But this will not be true in my era. This is a quick fix society. Experts tell me 30 years from now, I will be celebrating the 10th anniversary of my divorce. I do not concede that I will live in a country of my own making. In the future, environmental destruction will be the norm. No longer can it be said that my peers and I care about this earth. It will be evident that my generation is apathetic and lethargic. It is foolish to presume that there is hope. And all of this will come true unless we choose to reverse it. There is hope. It is foolish to presume that my generation is apathetic and lethargic. It will be evident that my peers and I care about this earth. No longer can it be said that environmental destruction will be the norm. In the future, I will live in a country of my own making. I do not concede that 30 years from now, I will be celebrating the 10th anniversary of my divorce. Experts tell me this is a quick fix society, but this will not be true in my era. Family stayed together once upon a time. I tell you this, family is more important than work. I have my priorities straight because my employer will know that they are not the most important thing in my life. So in 30 years, I will tell my children, money will make me happy is a lie, and true happiness comes from within. I realize this may be a shock, but I can change the world. And I refuse to believe that I am part of a lost generation. How cool is that? That's you. Don't let it be you. Sometimes in life, all you gotta do to change things up is look at it in a different perspective. The people around here who party every night, the people around here who drink every night and, and relish that, I wanna promise you something. Look at life a little differently. Look at life a little differently as to what you can contribute. George Washington Carver, a famous American, said this, no person has any right to come into this world and to leave it without leaving behind him or her a legitimate and distinct reason for having passed through it. Translation, you have a moral obligation to leave a legacy. So do I. You're here. You're in a seat. You should walk out of these doors four years from when you started and you should be able to say to me, I have made a change. I have made DU better. I have made my life better. I've made my student organization better. Not just, I got my degree and now I'm going to get a job. If DU is no better from the day you set foot in here to the day you leave, my friend, you've failed. If DU's better, you've won. And guess what? We've all won because this is my alma mater. Right? This is my school too. So when one of us does something dumb, we all look dumb. When one of us acts unethical, we all look unethical. Penn State, those are good people. But you hear Penn State and you just think of 12 or 15 bad people. I just want to encourage you. J just, you don't have to agree with a word that I'm saying tonight. I think I'm right, <laughs> but you don't have to agree. You owe me this. Critically think about your life. Who am I? What do I stand for? The end of that song says, some nights, I don't know. And the best word of the whole song is, anymore. I believe in our lives, at one point we all knew, we sort of all knew, didn't we? And then life bumped into us, and maybe we got into the wrong group of friends. I mean, I don't know, but at one point in our lives we knew, and maybe now we don't. When I was your age, I didn't, and I wasted a lot of time not knowing. But now that I know what I stand for, man, I'm gonna tell you something, I wake up every day happy. That doesn't mean every one of my days is roses. It snowed today, right? But I woke up this morning happy. And then I freaked out that it was snowing. <laughs> And I'm going to wake up tomorrow happy, and I'm going to freak out that it's snowing. But I wake up happy because for once in my life, I'm chasing real rabbits, chasing things that matter. I hope you all enjoy this weekend. I hope you relish this. This will never happen again. Just relish it. You'll look back. You'll never look back and remember your party on Friday night. You'll remember something like this. You'll remember these times, time with your peers, your friends, the future leaders of this country. Man, you'll remember this night, even though you don't want to be here now. Thank you for being awesome, audience. It's that passion for what he does that inspires me to be a better professor for you guys. And I hope that each of you take away something from that. Um, he works day in and day out to make this happen. And we try really hard to make this an incredible experience. And that's my inspiration right there. So I hope that you guys take some of what 
I get from that, and I hope you enjoyed it. Um, for my Daniels students, we are headed back to Daniels to get dinner. Groups 1 through 18 will go to Marcus Commons to pick up their Chipotle. Groups 19 through 35 will go to the second floor atrium area to get their dinner, and then you'll be with your student leaders. Enjoy. My community members, Professor Chiquetti will be out in the hallway to speak with you. Thank you.